jets are a different story. The shape of the planes and the giant engines that make them fast also make them temperamental and inherently unstable. Human beings and mechanical connections are just not quick enough to keep these jets under control. So fighter pilots are teamed up with computers in a system called fly-by-wire. Control is operated especially like in a jet like this with a fly-by-wire system, which means computers are trying to help you out, trying to fly the jet as best you can. It's going to get the control surfaces moving to their utmost. Yeah, everything is still the same when you're feeling the stick. There's going to be artificial feels that are put in there that allow you to feel the actual control surfaces move. Now, you're moving the stick isn't actually moving the control surfaces. It's just a series of bungees set up to give you that artificial feel. It's very much like the brake system in your car or the steering system. It may feel like a mechanical connection, but an onboard computer is sending digital instructions to hydraulic activators, which in turn move the various control surfaces. Or you can fly the computer without the plane. Flight simulators have been bestsellers since the coming of the home computer. This one is modeled after the control system of an F-18 jet, but it only hints at the complexity a fighter pilot faces. Flying a fighter plane is like playing two pianos at the same time because of all the buttons and dials and things you have to work at once just to make the airplane fly and fight. And it takes literally a year to do that, to, to learn how to fly the airplane and then how to fight the airplane. The thing is, we've gotten to the point where computers help us out enough that we can have aircraft do things that they were never able to do before. In fact, there's aircraft out there today that cannot be flown unless the computer systems are helping out the pilot do his job. While a 747 thankfully doesn't do the kind of maneuvers that a fighter jet or aerobatic plane might do, Commercial aircraft also use computer systems to move their control surfaces. As passengers on a Boeing 777 watch movies 35,000 feet over Newfoundland, the computers are busy displaying readouts recording every critical function of the airplane and crunching numbers. Total flying time will be no more than 210, I'm sure. Even a small corporate jet like John Travolta's Gulfstream II is computerized. Even with uh, medium range technology, which is what I'm used to, I'll kick off the autopilot and fly an approach on my own just to feel it. You know, uh, I think there's still the urge to be a pilot. And that's why airplane designers have to take into account human limits in creating their flying machines. I mean, I've been up in several military jets and and, uh, you know, flown a lot of airlines and han handled the controls of 747s and things like that, and they're flying. And especially these military pilots, I think a lot of the uh, small aerobatic pilots, you know, that pull a lot of Gs, it's easy to go, hey, you know, we pull more Gs than you do. But in a military plane, the Gs are sustained. Pilots call gravity's powerful force on the human body Gs. They are brought on by sudden changes in attitude or speed. Gs are just uh, the force of gravity. And when we're walking around the Earth and our feet are on the ground, we're being pulled by one force of gravity, one G. When you go up in an airplane or in a car, you experience more Gs. So anybody that's gone around the curve of a car and gets thrown to the outside, those are Gs. As an airplane moves through a curve, the acceleration creates high G forces that drive the pilot toward the bottom of his chair. High positive Gs drive a pilot's blood away from his brain and toward his feet, causing a blackout. Body conditioning and special gear can help prevent that. No matter how high tech the plane or well trained the pilot, things can go wrong. Well, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. The engine can quit, uh, you can have an engine failure, um, you can have a propeller failure. You can lose a piece of your propeller. Uh, you could have a structural failure. Um, something could break in the airplane. Those are the main things. You could have a fire. I, I think that 
if you experience terror in the airplane, you're not going to be doing your job properly. And I, you know, I've had emergencies, but you need to just react to those things. You can't be afraid because then you get frozen with fear. On a cloudy night in 1992, while flying his family to their vacation home, John Travolta's entire electrical system failed. Landing without a radio and little navigational gear took Travolta back to the way pilots had to do it in the early days of aviation. On a very rare occasion, you get uh, an electrical failure. And in my situation, uh, there was uh, several consecutive electrical failures. Okay. From my early days of learning how to fly, you learn even from being in a single engine plane that uh, if you are in IFR conditions, you find a hole in the sky if you can, and you spiral down through that hole and then proceed to locate an area to land. And in this case, uh, I was able to do that. I found a hole in the sky, spiraled down, and uh, hovered over Washington and landed safely. And the guys from the tower and uh, some other officials came down to shake the hand of the pilot that safely landed the jet at National Airport. And then they found out it was me, and that was even more interesting. Uh, but uh, I was very proud of that moment because I felt that all the years I went to school, it paid off. And even my earliest training paid off, where uh, you learn uh, to fly a plane when you lose everything. Ever since the first powered flight, designers have tinkered with airfoils, engines, fuels, and materials to coax more speed from their crafts. The problem lies not so much in reaching the speed of sound, somewhere around 760 miles an hour at sea level, but in overcoming the severe punishment an aircraft takes as it approaches that speed. Here's why. Much like the wake of water at the tip of a boat, a plane creates a wave of pressure ahead of it, no matter how slow or fast it flies. When an airplane travels below the speed of sound, the air ahead of it flows out of the way before the plane reaches it. But as an aircraft approaches the speed of sound, it compresses the air in front into a dense shock wave. On the ground, you can hear that shock wave as a sonic boom. Aerodynamic engineers figured out how to slide through shock waves with thinner, streamlined wings and sharper edges that flew more cleanly through the compacted air. But for a supersonic transport like the Concorde, there are even tougher problems. While it takes passengers from New York to London in less than three and a half hours, the Concorde is considered an economic and environmental failure. At low speed, its streamlined shape doesn't produce much lift. So getting airborne means enormously loud and powerful fuel-guzzling engines. It holds only a quarter of the passengers and has half the range of a jumbo jet. Engineers are at work on a better alternative to the Concorde, a supersonic that will be more fuel efficient and much quieter. But most important, the next generation supersonic will be able to carry three times as many passengers. The idea behind a high-speed civil transport is to get a supersonic airplane that can, in fact, have the range to go from California to, say, the Pacific Rim in five hours, which is a reasonable amount of time. Most people can tolerate five hours of sitting in an airplane. Engineer and pilot Marta Bon Meyer heads a team at the Aeronautics Division of NASA. They're working on better ways to reduce drag. And again, it's all about how air flows. You've seen commercials on TV, for example, of cars in wind tunnels, and they let smoke out in front of the car, and the smoke runs along the hood of the car, goes up to the, the cab of the car, and then it kind of billows out. Well, where it's running along the car, and it's staying down inside close to the car, it's in, in the laminar boundary layer itself, or the layer of air that's flowing along the car. The boundary layer is the thin layer of air that flows along the surface of an aircraft. 
Engineers try to make it flow smoothly, avoiding the dirty word of aerodynamics, turbulence. Smooth laminar flow is equal to less drag. Less drag requires less thrust to maintain forward speed. And lower thrust takes less fuel, which means cheaper tickets for you and me. And that makes everybody happy. NASA is trying to come up with a way to create better laminar flow over the wing, thereby reducing drag.